after the domestic success of One Missed Call, production house Toho was quick to order a sequel. They brought back screenwriter Minako Daira to pen the script, once again drawing from a novel by Yasushi Akimoto. This time around, however, Takashi Miike was not brought back to helm the project, instead riding off into the sunset with a torrent of other films. He was replaced in the director's chair by Renpei Tsukamoto. Tsukamoto had one film and a few dramas under his belt prior to One Missed Call 2. With Renpei's direction, audiences were given a film split between Japan and Taiwan, with co-star Peter Ho helping to carry the film in his adoptive homeland. This might lead one to question if Toho was seeking an international hit thanks to the Americanization of J-horror, if One Missed Call 2 was intended to be a blockbuster in Taiwan as well as Japan. Alternatively, one might ask if Toho was seeking tax rebates or incentives offered by Taiwan for filming done within the country. These types of incentives have existed in Taiwan since at least 2018 for international productions. But we couldn't find any historical record of earlier tax write-offs or rebates. In fact, we reached out to the Taipei Film Commission to inquire whether incentives like these existed back at the turn of the century, and they informed us that, as far as they know, this film's production did not receive any sort of incentives or tax rebates. Either way, this time around, One Missed Call 2 introduced some new elements to the formula established by its predecessor. This time, we open at a Chinese restaurant where the owner, Mr. Wong, receives a phone call intended for his daughter. Mr. Wong dies in her place, and a patron of the restaurant follows soon after. We learn that Yumi has been missing since the end of the previous film a year prior. Further examination of each victim shows one detective, Motomiya, that all of them have coal dust in their bodies, even Mimiko. This in turn is traced back to her father being Taiwanese and fleeing to Taipei after jail time for murder. Journalist Takako Nozoe uses a Taiwanese connection in the form of her ex-husband to get to Taipei, only to learn that these types of killings are happening all over this country just as much as they are happening in Japan. It turns out this goes beyond Mimiko, back to a Taiwanese girl named Lili, who could proclaim deaths prior to their enactment. Lili went one step too far and had her mouth sewn shut, before being buried in a coal mine to shut her up and prevent her from further killings. After this revelation, a fever dream of an ending follows, with Takako unraveling the mystery of Lili and Mimiko's connection to her. After some tricky storytelling and camera work, we learn that Mimiko has once again duped the audience and our protagonist. Mimiko had in fact killed Takako in the mines and took on her persona to continue killing, much as was implied with Yumi at the conclusion of the first film. Thematically, One Missed Call 2 isn't far removed from its predecessor. Here we observe the nature of cycling once more, though in a more exaggerated manner. This time we travel both further back and further forward in time. We see how Mimiko's curse has caused several forks over time namely the Taiwanese Fork and the Japanese Fork. In Japan, we have Mimiko attacking Yumi and her social circle. In Taiwan, on the other hand, we roll back the clock to learn about Lili and how she affects Mimiko and Takako by proxy. Parallels exist between the two pathways, but this establishes that the Japanese Fork originated from the Taiwanese Fork. All of these cycles and parallels are once more helped by technology. Earlier, we saw how phones and cameras helped Mimiko spread her ill will. This time, we explore how airplanes facilitate travel between Japan and Taiwan, allowing international spread, how cell phone towers help to transmit the curse rapidly and discreetly, as well as how camcorders once again record the truth and perpetuate these cycles. In short, where One Missed Call showed technology as a medium for Mimiko to spread her rage, One Missed Call 2 shows how technology amplifies the stories of the past, bringing them back into the present and offering them greater influence on our world. In truth, beyond this, however, One Missed Call 2 is not too different from the first film. It's more of the same, really, but in a broader sense, given the international nature of the film and the wider timeline set up between Lili, Mimiko, and Takako. In other words, this serves as an effective sequel by increasing the scale of the proceedings and upping the stakes for our protagonists. It shows that there's a longer precedent for the reoccurrence of these influences, making the current events seem more sinister and dire. 
It also deepens the lore of the universe, and by necessity this means that we're seeing the same curse in different contexts. So basically, the film doesn't rock the boat much in terms of what the first established, instead reiterating and building rather than replacing and shattering its foundation. In this manner, One Missed Call 2 could be said to be filling the shoes of the first film, but bigger. Not just in a spatial or temporal sense. Here we observe more suspense than in the first film. It's more creepy than the first film. It's less bombastic with its presentation that one might expect of Miike. In this case, you could almost call it restrained. This is of course thanks to the film having a different director than the first, but it's notable in driving home how One Missed Call 2 offers something of a variation on a theme, rather than something entirely new. In terms of being a larger, more full film, this is seen in how the cast is more or less doubled in size. Half of the film's runtime concerns Detective Motomiya, while the second half drops the whole law enforcement aspect and even the Japanese setting. Instead, the latter half of One Missed Call 2 focuses primarily on the younger generation in Taiwan. Given the size of the cast, though, we're also shown how all of them are interconnected. Early story characters Kyoko and her boyfriend break their phones in an attempt to flee the wrath of Mimiko. Within moments, the two find themselves in proximity of more phones. Their lives depend on it, yet the modern world has made them incapable of going off the grid. Later, when folks end up all the way in the boonies of Taiwan, they can't escape the network even this far out. A cell tower stands boldly in what is portrayed as the middle of nowhere. While the characters themselves are connected in one way or another, it's through these metaphors that we understand how connected they have been made on a fundamental level. By following the progression of all these characters, we see that we're not so much following one group's story, but a series of links between different people, exploring their connections and their individual struggles. One Missed Call 2 will likely find fans amongst those who enjoyed the first entry in the series, and who wondered how the story may have played out slightly differently. It will also likely strike a chord with those interested in international cinema, specifically Japanese-Taiwanese crossovers. As with the first, it's certainly worth giving a look if you're interested in this franchise, or horror in particular, or the J-horror era in general. Give it a look if you haven't already, and let us know below what you think of the film. And be sure to join us next time, when we'll be wrapping up this trilogy.